Well, well it's, it's so nice to be here and see everyone and um, yeah, and particularly um, to be here for, for, for Mark's birthday as well. So um, yeah, well, I'll, I'm, I'm just going to move over from the first slide. So um, by chance, um, me and Fridolf picked almost identical photos, except this is a year earlier than the previous uh, canoe uh, photo. So you, you may recognize lots of, lots of faces, there are lots of people are actually here. And um, personally, I don't think, I think we all look just as youthful as we did back then. I, we haven't aged a bit, we all look great. Um, and so, um, so this is, this is 2001. So this was um, when I first met Mark, was actually in Edmonton Airport when he picked me up from my flight from Scotland to uh, Edmonton. And I hadn't expected to see him there. So I was, I was like, it was just so amazing that he picked me up. And, um, and he took me to where I was staying. And that's where I met Fridjof for the first time as well. And uh, he introduced me to mathematical ecology. I hadn't worked in that field before. He took a chance on me and let me join his lab. And, and he just created this amazing uh, community, which I think is what this like picture represents for me. It was the community he generated and also um, encouraging us to step out of our comfort zones and work across disciplines. And so for me, that summarizes a lot of, of, of the things I've, um, many things I've learned from, from Mark. Um, so um, when, I, when I first started in Edmonton, I was working on um, problems to do with habitat fragmentation. And, and, um, and then that, that theme sort of continued. And so in 2010, uh, Mark organized a workshop at Nimbus. And, um, and then we started um, thinking about scales there. So we were looking at um, the, the theme of that workshop was looking at the effect of spatial and temporal scales and how uh, forest insect dynamics were affected by spatial and temporal scales. And that, that, those sort of questions that came up in that workshop was really how um, a lot of the work in this talk came about and, and how um, Fridjof and I then started discussing these ideas and worked over like many years <laughs> to get to the point where we are now. So um, let me tell you a bit about the, the, the problem. So I'll introduce a bit of background to the problem we want to solve, um, the kind of methodology um, that we use, and, and how that methodology then connects to some classic ideas of residence index and, and dynamic level. So these are ideas introduced by um, Turchin and Skellum quite a long time ago. And again, these are ideas that actually Mark first introduced me to when I was in Edmonton. And then I'll, I'll take you through some examples to see, show you how like some mathematical theory can give you some interesting ecological insights. So, um, so here's, here's the, the problem that we were interested in. So um, this landscape here is a very large landscape. So it's of the order of like 30 kilometers there. And this is quite a typical landscape that um, organisms might move in. There's lots of organisms that travel very large, over very large landscapes um, in the course of their lifetime. Um, but and, and at first glance, that picture on the left looks very homogeneous in terms of the habitat, but it's actually not. And we see that when we zoom in here. And um, so what we see is that actually the landscape's made up of um, lots of different types of, of habitat. In this case, different types of uh, tree species and there's a sagebrush there. And so in the course of, um, in this case, mule deer moving through this landscape, it's in encountering lots of habitat types and the shading here indicates the motility it has in those different um, habitat types. And, and so we can see that the, the, the environment the animal's moving in is affecting um, its behavior quite a lot. Um, so we somehow would like to be able to capture this detail, but our questions are often at this much larger scale. Um, so our questions are often, for example, like range expansion, that might be our question, and we want to think about these large kilometer scales, but we want to incorporate this detail, and how do we how do, we do this? Um, if we zoom in a bit further, then um, if we look at what happens between patches, then quite often a lot of organisms have responses to um, habitat edges and boundaries between habitat types. So this is data from the Fender's blue butterfly. And what you see in this data is um, over on the left here is the loop in where the butterflies like to um, hang out. And then on the right is um, some um, other habitat. And then there's another looping patch over here. And what you find is that lupin kind of, um, the butterflies congregate on the boundary of the patch here because they're reluctant to cross over um, into this um, other habitat that they don't like so much. And you see this kind of behavior in lots of organisms. So 
we would like to somehow incorporate all this kind of detail, this fine scale detail, but still asking these um, large scale questions. Um, from a different angle, this kind of question, um, people have also been thinking about it from a computational point of view. So, um, so often when people are doing large um, scale simulations of big landscapes, and they've got some kind of environmental data, say satellite data of the environment, they quite often aggregate grid cells and um, use the aggregate properties of those grid cells to work out the growth rate or the motility for, um, for their species of, of interest. And so what, um, what um, Bodice did and collaborators was they looked at what happens in numerical simulations if you do that. So if they don't aggregate and just simulate across the fine scale landscape or we do this aggregation. And, um, and what they found was that um, actually you overestimate a lot of key properties of the um, dynamics. So range expansion, the, the, they um, overestimated range expansion, they overestimated um, population density as well. And so um, what they termed this as is the fallacy of the averages. And basically this comes down to Jensen's inequality. And it comes down to the fact that um, species will be undergoing nonlinear interactions and that non, those nonlinear effects means that just straightforward averaging can cause you problems. So then, the, so then the question is, well, how do we deal with this? So there have been attempts to do to solve this problem. Often people tend to focus either on the kind of movement aspect or the population dynamics aspect. Few have brought the two together. Um, scale transition theory is one, one example where they have brought it together, but often um, the quantities they end up with aren't geared towards then asking questions about, for example, range expansion. Um, they're asking slightly different questions. So we wanted to somehow come up with some tools that might allow us to kind of address these kind of questions. So, um, so here's our approach. We want to bridge this gap between the small scale data and this small scale patch models that we might have developed and our large scale question. We want a model that captures the fine scale details, but that we can work with that answer the large scale questions. And so um, the framework we use to do this is reaction diffusion equations. So that's an area Mark has contributed to a lot in the, in the uh, last um, uh, few decades. So um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pull out some of the results that, that, um, that he's contributed as, as I go along. Um, so the model we're gonna use, um, we're just looking, I'm just gonna illustrate in a very um, simple case. So it, we're just looking at a one dimensional space of made up of two habitat types, just alternating. And, um, and then in this environment, we've got a, a reaction diffusion equation. Um, we have ecological diffusion, where the diffusion rates depend on the spatial location to capture this effect of moving through different habitat types. And similarly, in our demographics, that also depends on space so that different habitats might have different growth rates or different interactions. Strengths might happen in different locations. So that's the kind of um, model setup we want to use. If we, um, we have to make some assumptions to apply, our, uh, apply the theory that I'm going to show you. Um, those two assumptions are the organisms encounter many habitats um, over their lifetime. Um, and the other one is, so in other words, they move through, through lots of these little bars. And the other one is that um, if I look at the scale of the habitat, the effects of the demographics are quite small. It's mainly driven by space at this very fine scale. Okay. Um, so in other words, they're moving through the patches quickly enough that there's not much change in demographics um, while they're in a patch. So those are the two assumptions, and we'll come back to how realistic they are um, later. Okay. So um, if I zoom in and look at what happens between two patches, I want to capture these patch edge effects. So, um, and so zooming in, uh, we've got our two patch lengths here, so they might be different. And we've got some preference um, alpha u at the habitat edges. So alpha u is the probability that when you're at a patch one, patch two edge, that you will preferentially go for patch one and stay at that, that edge. So this, this kind of um, setup can then lead to that aggregation at, ed, at boundaries that we saw in the data. Um, and so it leads to these boundary conditions at patch edges. Um, so this is something that uh, Fridjof's worked on a lot and uh, was developed by Overskynen and, and Cornell. 
um, in the early 2000s. And what's interesting about the boundary conditions, the bottom one's just a continuity of flux, so what you might expect. But the, this one here is, um, is about density. And what happens is you have a discontinuous density. It leads to discontinuous density at boundaries. Um, and that can happen if either alpha u, this preference for a patch is not, um, is not a half, like you don't like both equally. But it can also happen if your diffusion rates in the two patches are different, can lead to this discontinuity in density. So, um, so those are the ingredients in our model. And so what we want to do is, that, so all these details on a very fine scale, then trying to kind of simulate this at a very large scale is challenging and also trying to understand the effects of these fine scale on the larger scale questions is also challenging. So we want to use homogenization to um, get a, a, a good approximate large scale model. And the idea of homogenization is not so different from what we might do in temporal problems. So to give you an example, um, if we think about uh, just to, just forget space for a second, just think about um, some like the environment rapidly changing in, in time. So, for example, because of um, climate temperature, temperature changing over the course of um, our, our days or weeks. Um, so what we know is that if you have a rapid change in environment and, and that may change your growth rate, then if you take the average of your growth rate over the um, over your over time, then that's a good representation of your your growth rate. And so some and, and so the same idea applies with homogenization but in space. So the idea here is that although our environment now is temporarily constant, it's not changing in time, it changes in space. And what happens is the organism over its lifetime moves through lots of spatial locations, encounters lots of environments. So in some sense, it's seeing the environment change in time rapidly. So in some sense, we would expect some kind of average to work here as well. And so that's the idea of homogenization. We are going to come up with some kind of average. And the question is, what is that? And how does it differ from, from what we might like just naively use? Okay. So the way to do homogenization, first of all, we need to set up our, our scales. Um, so we start off with our large space, which in this case I've said is in kilometers. And then we zoom in. So that's, that's our scale X, our landscape scale. And then we zoom in. And then we've got our small scale of the, of the patches, which in this case is of tens of meters. Okay. And so we can relate these two um, by the epsilon here. And so this is giving us some kind of scale that we're gonna work with. But if we, if we make an analogy to watching a movie, then if we're zooming in on space, if we don't do something about time, then if I'm zooming in to look at my organism moving through space, then it's gonna just move through my little patches very, very quickly. And so it'll just be a blur and I won't see what's going on. So um, if I'm gonna work at the habitat scale, this local scale, I also need to slow down time. So we need a time scaling. Um, and so here's a little image of what I just described. We need to slow down time so we can see what's going on. And the way we do that scaling is we choose it so that the mean squared displacement, the magnitude of that is the same on both scales. Okay, so tau is our new, is our time scale for the uh, local, our local view of things, and then t the time scale for our landscape view. And we want the magnitude of the mean squared displacement to be the same. That's driven by the fact we're using a reaction diffusion model. So a different model of movement, we would use a different, uh, we'd make a different choice here, but with that choice, that gives us our, our temporal scales. Okay. So we've got our temporal and our spatial scales, and they're related by this epsilon that's telling us uh, how, how the local scale relates to the global scale. Now, with this, we can then um, uh, put that into our PDE. But before I do that, I want to talk a bit about, well, how, how do we find these epsilons? And if I look at them for real organisms, do they satisfy these assumptions that I talked about at the start about the theory? So let's look at that before we go any further. Um, so here is those two assumptions again. Um, so it's about the organisms um, that over their lifetime go through lots of different habitats. And when they're in a habitat, they don't spend long enough in a habitat that, that their demographics are changing too much. So those are the assumptions. Um, and here are four examples from completely different taxa where this is, this is true. Um, in fact, um, Mark has worked in three of these, three of these areas. Um, 
I'm pretty sure it hasn't worked in all four, but I could be wrong. <laughs> um, so the chat, so this is another coffee question. Which, which one has Mark not worked on? So, um, <laughs> okay, so let me, I'm just gonna quickly talk about the top one. Um, so mountain pine beetle invasions. So, um, so here, um, what we're interested in is the invasion of the beetles. So these beetles um, cause death of trees when they attack trees in large numbers. And so people are asked in, interested in this uh, question of invasion. And these, these invasions happen over the scale of kilometers. And so that's our landscape scale here, our X. And it's also the scale of dispersal of the beetles. And then our, our habitat scale Y is in hectares, because this is the scale at which the tree uh, type varies. And then in terms of the time, uh, we have the, the landscape scale time is of the order of years. And then the uh, habitat scale is on the order of, order of hours and days, because this is how long it takes to go through a habitat um, patch. And the idea is that actually on the, sc the, the scale of hours and days, there's not much change in the demographics of the beetles because they have a one year generation. So all of the change in demographics of the beetles is happening over a much longer time scale than the time scale at which it takes them to cross uh, trees in the habitat. So this is, a, this is a, a very natural example of where we're satisfying all the criteria. And from this, we can work out an epsilon, okay? So, um, and then we can do the similar arguments for these other species as well. So actually quite a few systems would naturally um, satisfy these constraints. They're not actually that restrictive. So now we know the, the sort of ideas work, um, let's, let's put that into the model. So there's our original reaction diffusion equations on the patches. These are the two scales I've introduced. And so then we can change variables um, and think of U as, exp as um, expressed in terms of these two scales and that these scales are independent, do a change of variables on this PDE. And then we're gonna look for a series solution. So that's the idea of homogenization. We look through a series solution of the new equations after we've changed scales. Um, and we want to find the leading order approximation to that. So that's basically the sort of methodology behind homogenization. Um, so I'm not going to say much more about that. Um, and if we do that, then this is what we end up with. Um, and so um, what we've got here is that the leading order approximation then is um, our average density of our population in space accounting for the average effects of habitat. And then we've got this um, other term here that depends on why. So the big thing is that you see the effects of, of landscape and habitat are separated out. Okay, so that's one thing that happens when you do the homogenization. Um, we end up then with an equation that tells us how U changes um, the average population density, and that's driven by these reaction diffusion equations. The big thing about um, what homogenization has done for us is that you can see there's no longer an X dependence in those diffusion coefficients or in the demographics that's gone. And that's what homogenization has done for us. It's kind of averaged that out. Um, and so that, and then these, these PGEs that we've got left to solve are gonna be much easier to solve on landscapes than the original equations were. Okay. Um, so before I say anything about the details of what exactly these new functions are. You can see they've got hats on, they're not the same as the original parameters. Um, I wanna make some connections to some classic ideas. As I said um, at the beginning, these are actually ideas that Mark introduced me to. So when, when, when I was in Edmonton, um, we had um, various like working groups and lab meetings. And one of them was looking through this book by Peter Turchin, which is an amazing book, lots of amazing stuff in there. Um, and, and Mark also has taught me the value of like looking at some of these like older papers. I don't know if you've ever looked at some of Skellum's original stuff, but there's, it's like a gold mine of, of, of results in there. And so these quantities here actually relate to two of these classic ideas. So the, the row here is actually residence index and the U is related to something called dynamic level. So I'm gonna tell you what they are because what it turns out is by taking this homogenization approach, we can actually understand what these average equations are that we end up with in terms of ecological quantity. So that's what I want to kind of um, illustrate here. So I'll first of all, tell you a bit about what residence index and dynamic level is if you haven't encountered those ideas before. 
Okay, so starting off with residence index. Um, oops, sorry, oh, there we go. Um, so in the, the simplest sense, if you think about just a purely movement model, no demographics, and the no density dependent movement, then residence index is just one over the motility. Um, now that's true here as well. Here's the expressions for uh, the residence index for the two patch types here. And you can see there's one over the diffusion of coefficients in the two patches. But then we've got these extra factors of the alpha here for us. So this is a little bit different to what you might find, uh, for example, in Turchin's book, because we've got these patch, of, patch edge effects. So what that alpha is doing there, if we imagine alpha is big, so close to one, that means that when we reach a patch one, patch two boundary, that they're pre preferring to stay in patch one. So when alpha u is close to one, they prefer to stay in patch one. Okay. So when alpha u is big, this quantity is small. So this residence index is going to be large. Okay. And so the residence index for patch one will be large when I prefer to be in patch one, or if diffusion rate in patch one is small. Okay. I don't move much in patch one. And so, um, and so that's the idea of what residence index is. It's inverse to motility, so it means it's high when you don't move much in that patch, you want to linger there. And you can relate residence index to residence time if you uh, multiply by the length of your, your patches or in two dimensions by the, the, the area, and, um, and then you'll get a quantity that's proportional to residence time. So we can think of residence index in some sense um, it's proportional to the, the time you spend in, in the patches, okay? The average time you spend in the patches. And the beauty of these quantities that is appearing in our equations is that you can measure it empirically. So although getting these um, alphas, for example, might be a bit tricky, you actually don't need to do that. You can actually instead just go and re measure residence time. And uh, Mevin Hooten and some co-authors did some nice work on this uh, recently, where they use some statistical methods to actually estimate residence index from and residence time from telemetry data. So this is telemetry data from mountain lion, and the shading in this picture is the residence times. So you can actually just empirically get these numbers for all the habitat types um, from the data. We don't need to estimate the individual components of the residence index um, separately. So that's a nice um, one nice thing about this quantity that appears in our equations. Okay. So then what about dynamic level? That was the other um, quantity I mentioned. And it turns out that relates directly to residence index. So um, dynamic level is, um, it's basically um, proportion. So residence index is proportional to the equilibrium density of um, uh, organisms when they're just undergoing diffusion, okay? And that constant of proportionality there is what the dynamic level is. So the, the best way to think about dynamic level is to um, think about, um, make an analogy with some physics. So, um, so dynamic level is um, always gonna be continuous in space, it's always gonna be constant in space, whereas um, population density will be discontinuous because of these boundary effects. And so um, one of the difficulties with homogenizing is that we've got this discontinuity. So the idea where this, why dynamic levels popped up is because it's allowed us to move from a discontinuous variable to a continuous one. Okay. And um, so here's the analogy. So if we make the analogy that, um, that heat is like population and temperature is like dynamic level, then uh, what you find is if you put your hand on a wall, like the thermal properties of my hand and the wall are different, okay? So what's gonna happen is the um, temperature between my hand and my, the wall will equilibrate and eventually they'll be the same temperature, okay? So that's dynamic level, it'll equilibrate out. But the heat will remain discontinuous because that's what's holding that, that's what's holding the, allowing the temperatures to be the same. And so, so it turns out that this dynamic level naturally comes up in our computations and it has the advantage it naturally connects to a residence index because it relates equilibrium density, residence index and dynamic level equilibrium. And so where equilibrium is coming up here is because if we think about what's happening at the patch level, right? At the patch level, organisms are 
moving through the patches very quickly. So the dynamics aren't, the demographics aren't changing much. So they're essentially at equilibrium. And so this is how this is coming up. At the patch level, things are basically at equilibrium. And so we have the residence index at the patch level and the dynamic level at the patch level. And so this is how all these quantities have just sort of naturally appeared in our, in our homogenization process. And this is how we've ended up with this nice formula for our population density in space. And we can separate out these effects of the residence index, the time in each habitat, and these uh, larger scale fact effects, which are the sort of equilibrium effects of all the moving through all the habitat types. Okay, so going back to the homogenized model that we ended up with. Um, so uh, there's the, the equations again. Uh, so I've talked a bit about, about this now, what the density means, and that this is an uh, average population density. If we look at then the terms in the equations, the diffusion coefficients are basically one over the average residence time in, in the, uh, uh, our patches, or in other words, or a harmonic average of the patch level motilities. They're the same thing. Um, so that's a nice idea. That relates to ideas that, um, for example, Jim Powen had, had looked at um, before when he was just looking at movement models. He found that, um, that the diffusion coefficient you should end up with should be like average residence time. But now we have this extra addition of these boundary effects as well, but you still get this, the same quantity still pops out very naturally. Um, in terms of the demographics, you end up with an average. So this F is the average of the Fs on the patches weighted by their patch lengths. But then what you see is the, the terms inside the functions are basically the average population density. They're basically this, the average population density weighted by how much time I'm in the patch. So that's what pops up in here. And so, um, so we're actually averaging functions, and this is kind of why these nonlinearities kind of matter, but they naturally pop up in these expressions. So one thing to, to say about this before I move on, I've shown you the theory for one dimension, just two habitat types, but the, the concepts are quite general. So we, we'd expect a lot of this to just hold much more generally than um, just one dimension. For example, the idea of a residence index applies in in two dimensions so you can measure it in two dimensions so we would expect this kind of equations to still work when we're thinking about two-dimensional problems or more habitat types you just expand the averages and include more terms but conceptually they should still you'd expect that the idea should still hold higher up okay so um let's try and now now we sort of have these equations um I want to kind of look delve a bit deeper and see if we can actually whether it's whether it's worth the effort do we get any ecological insights from from this um so so that's what i want to go into um next um just before i do that i just want to show you quickly an illustration of uh this a simulation just a very simple model just basically fisher's equation on a patchy environment um and the black is the full computational model of the full patchy environment and then the red here is the homogenized solution. I don't know if you can see, but the black and red are essentially indistinguishable. And you can see at the patch level that you get these, these um, discontinuity in the solution as you've got these edge effects going on. So you can see actually that the approach works like it does. It does, does do a good job of capturing what's happening. So but what what but so what does it give us any ecological insights? So um, so I'm going to illustrate that with an example. So um, I'm going to look at a predator prey problem and I'm going to look at um, questions looking at invasion because this is an area like Mark has done a lot of work in over the years looking at um, invasion dynamics. And so um, and, and in particular, he's, he's done some work on looking at um, predators invading prey environments. So that's what I'm going to use as an example here. Okay. So um, I'm just going to take a simple predator prey model. And um, so we have um, Rosenzweig MacArthur dynamics and a type two functional response on each patch. So there's the prey demographics and the predator demographics. And um, so these are the patch level quantities. And you can see we've got the index I indicating that these various things vary um, according to patch type. Um, and then we can use the homogenization, right? We can get our landscape level dynamics, which are just doing the right averaging, as I've, as I've mentioned. 
Um, but then what does that tell us? So let's, let's just start by unpacking the functions. Before we even look at dynamics, let's unpack the functions to see what's going on. So I'm going to start by just looking at the functional response. So this is the patch level functional response, type two functional response, very, um, you know, using the literature lots. Here's a plot of it. So a plot of U versus the functional response. Um, the handling time H is the sort of asymptote here. And then the attack rate is the gradient near the origin. So there's our functional response in, in red for this, this one. And here's what you end up with the landscape. It's the average of the patch level type one, type two functional responses. But the important thing is it's a different functional form to the patch level. Oops, sorry. It's a different functional form. And it turns out that um, what if you say naively said, well, I'm going to work out the attack rate and the handling time for this just by taking sensible averages. I'm going to work out the attack rate by taking the average of the attack rate, accounting for how much time they spend in the patches. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do the same for handling time. But then I'm just going to put that in my type two functional response. So if you do that, you get the red curve. If you use the blue one, which is what our theory says you should be using, you get the blue curve here. And what you see is it's underneath. Um, and so, so, what, so what happens is, in fact, you overestimate functional response if you just assume it's going to have the same form at the landscape level as it did at the patch level. And this is why um, Bodice was seeing these increased range expansion rates when they were just uh, when when people when they were using the approach of just like averaging parameters to work out what parameters you should use for the um, aggregated models and it's it's basically this fallacy of the averages kicking in there the functional responses aren't actually the same at the patch level and the landscape level even in this simple example okay. um, if we unpack a little bit further then we can kind of sort of see what's um, happening here so um, here's the attack rate at the landscape level here's it at the patch level in the lower case and you can see it's it's got to do with the amount of the residence times in of the prey and the predator in the in the patch so the attack rate in patch i has got to do with um what or the amount of time they're spending in those patches as well and so even if you're in an environment where the at the patch level the attack rates were the same in every patch if you're spending different amounts of time in those patches at the landscape level, it will have an effect on the attack rates because attack rates is also about, well, am I going to encounter the prey if I'm a predator? Am I spending time in the right places to find the prey in the first place? And that naturally comes up in these equations. And the same is true with handling time as well. So, so we get even just without even looking at the dynamics, we can kind of unpack the uh, landscape level equations and understand how the habitat level information is impacting what we see in the landscape dynamics okay so um if we look at um this example of attack rate so this is me plotting the um attack rate at the landscape model and i've got here um the relative prey residence index and relative predator index and so on the right that's preferring patch one on the left per in patch two and the same in the vertical direction and in this example, I've got the attack rate on patch one is lower than on patch two. And so what's interesting about this example is on the bottom left and the top right, this is where the predator and prey have aligned their, their space use. So they're both um, here choosing to use patch two or here choosing to pa use patch one. On the off diagonal, they're, they're choosing opposite patches. They're spending, they're using opposite patches um, to each other more. And what's interesting is when they align the space use, you can see this yellow region, which gives you an attack rate of two at the landscape level, which is actually higher than it is on individual patches. So you can actually end up with higher attack rates at the landscape level than at the habitat level. So it's not something you would necessarily expect if you were just um, hadn't thought through all the, the scaling. So, really the what happens at the landscape level when you think include all these details um really does um really does matter um and so here's some examples of just some data to show you you do get um examples of um predator and prey aligning their space use or not so this is um this is a, a, a vicunia uh which is a um you can found in i think argentina and this is 
um, a puma, and this is a predator for this. And here's some, these are resource selection functions. And you can see in this environment, these are two types of parts of the landscape you can find them in. In this environment, the two align their space use. And then in this environment here, which is a valley, um, you find that they actually um, don't align their space use. And so um, the, 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 the red here is where, you, where the animals are aggregated. And so you can find systems where they, they do either of those extremes on, on the graph. So um, at, the hab, at the landscape level, they could, that this could lower or it high, increase the attack rate. Okay, so then what about invasion, since that's was where I said I was the example I was going to think about. So I'm going to think about then um, an environment where we have our prey in the landscape at equilibrium and the predator is, um, has arrived and is invading into that space. So that's um, something that, that uh, Mark has, has worked on with, with collaborators and, and did a nice paper on this um, in, in the early 2000s. And this is the formula that um, they had for um, the wave speed of the predator, um, it follows like a fissure, uh, the, the, the formula that you get from the fissures equation. So we've got um, the diffusion coefficient, and then this term here is basically the growth rate of the predator in a prey, uh, when the prey is at equilibrium. Okay, so it's kind of what you expect is the, for the wave speed. And so let's, let's have a look at what, what happens in this scenario. So what we might expect just looking at this formula before we do anything is that well we know from um just traveling way stuff that if you increase diffusion it increases wave speed right so we might think i'm going to increase my diffusion in one of the patches i should increase wave speed for the predator okay so that might be my conjecture um and so if the if the prey uh, don't have any preference for habitat types. That's indeed what you see. That's the black line here. I'm increasing the, the diffusion rate in patch two of, for the predator and the predator wave speeds going up, as you might expect. But if the prey prefer patch two, then I find that's not true. And in fact, it decreases the wave speed. And so what's happening here is that um, because the predator's moving more quickly through patch two, but that's where the prey prefer to be, the predator essentially missing the prey. And so it's causing this functional response to go down, the, the number of predators going down because the predator is just moving through the environment where the prey are and missing them. So, um, so and that all naturally comes out of um, looking at these landscape models. So increasing predator movement rate doesn't necessarily increase predator invasion speed. Um, if instead the prey prefer patch one, then if you move the predator moves more quickly through patch two, then as you as you might expect, the wave speed of the predator goes up because it's moving quickly through the patches where there aren't prey, and um, and so we're getting to the prey quicker. So that that kind of intuitive, but there's something else about this plot that that's not what we expect. So um, this blue curves below the black one. So why does the prey preferring patch two, patch one, mean a slower wave speed than if there's no preference. And again, we can unpack that as well. Um, so if we look at what the prey is doing, um, then we can understand what's going on here. So here is as a function of um, the relative residence time. So preferring prey preferring patch two, prey preferring patch one. And this is the prey density at equilibrium. Then what you see is it peaks when there's no preference. And what's happening is that if the prey prefer one patch or, or the other, whichever that is, then um, they're aggregating there. So you're increasing the effects of intraspecific competition. So you've got less prey. And so what we then see in the wave speed is that this blue curve is lower when there's the prey prefer a habitat habitat because there's going to be less prey because of the effects of intra-Pacific competition are uh, leading this to be lower. So it's having an effect on this term here, and that's why we see the slower wave speed. So we can we can use this sort of approach of um, using this homogenization can give us all these ecological insights into what might happen at a landscape level that makes sense when we unpack them, but we might not access necessarily expect ahead of time. <clears throat> 
Okay, so um, I'm just going to um, just like summarize now. So, um, so one key thing was that residence time was a as an important concept when we're thinking about um, coming up with these landscape models and thinking about how much time an organism spends in locations. Um, and it can help us explain some of these counterintuitive results that um, we're finding with um, computational models. And the alignment of residence time, so if, those, if organisms use their space in the same way, it can amplify effects at the habitat level, they can get amplified when we see them at the landscape level. Um, beware of your functional forms that you just what happens at the habitat level and the landscape level may not be the same because of Jensen's inequality um, and that, that for the fine scale heterogeneity can do surprising things that that increasing predator movement may well not increase um, predator wave speed even though you might expect it expect it to um, so I just want to um, like finish there and just thank people. I mean, I want to thank Mark because um, this project really wouldn't have happened if um, he hadn't started introducing me to these ideas of thinking about scales and heterogeneity. I wouldn't have met um, uh, Fridjof or, or Brian. I wouldn't have met any of these people if I hadn't been that. So Brian and Fridjof, uh, um, uh, we worked together on this project along with this gang here, which is part of uh, an Ames uh, uh, square. And so you can see another a familiar character there there's Thomas there so he was involved in in this project as well and so um, I want to thank them and then I'll I'll finish there thank you